Hello everyone, welcome to The Interchange, brought to you by Maximize. I am Rahel and this is your co-host Matt and we talk about everything related to interpersonal communication. So Matt, tell us what's our topic for the day. So today's topics are going to be training and development and having fun at work. And our guest today is Michael Lawrence. He's a learning and operational development professional at Creative Edge. He considers himself a walking Seinfeld episode, and he uh, aspires to help people learn their value at work and in their personal lives, become a thought leader in the learning space, and get a speeding ticket at age 100. (laughs) Michael's greatest achievements are being a father, creating his own space in the corporate world and learning and development, and being the first in his family to go to college from high school and graduate. So welcome, Michael. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm excited to join you today. So let's have some fun in the process. So. Awesome. <laughs> let's do it. Let's do it. Awesome. So I'm curious right up front. Mm-hmm. So you are a walking sign field. What does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> Well, the one of the things I used to love about Seinfeld, um, and, and I saw that we did in college when I was young as well, which I, I wish we would have got the idea first or expounded on it first, was just seeing how funny everyday life is. And when we just take what's right in front of us and enjoy it, um, we're actually really comical people, just just people in general, people watching. If you have never done it, it's just absolutely a phenomenal, excuse me, phenomenal pastime if you haven't tried it before. Uh, But that's where it came from. So some of the things like, uh, you know, from Seinfeld episodes, like there was one where they had, you know, they had the big salad, you know, that's, there's nothing special (laughs) about that. But the fact that you commented on it made it something that is actually quite comical. And we, we do that all the time. And when we can kind of lighten ourselves up a little bit, it makes it (laughs) makes life a lot easier for one thing, but you just kind of get to see the joy of what life really is on a day-to-day basis. So that's where kind of that, the whole Seinfeld episode comes from. And and we have a lot of references from those and, um, and it it becomes, it kind of becomes kind of a second language as well. When you're in, in, even in the learning environment, people remember that stuff. Um, And that's really what kind of gets them through all the different things that they learn on a day-to-day basis Um, in my courses or, you know, or even in their, in their own interactions. So. Cool, that's cool. cool. Oh, that's great. That's awesome. I, I, uh, it's, it's been a while since I watched Seinfeld, but you're right. He, he was really good about just uh, making fun of everyday kind of kind of things. And you know, the more the more we joke, you do you do learn more by joking. But also, uh, you know, you it, there's studies that show that you live a longer and happier life if you if you joke around more. So that's absolutely. Good. absolutely. So in terms, oh, yep. so in terms of. Uh, you know, learning and development, and you said you incorporate some of this into your learning and development. How, how do you how do you do that? Uh, really, it's the stories. I know that in the mo- in more recent years, uh, you've probably read more, seen more in the um, actually in the learning space where people are starting to celebrate stories a lot more. One of the things I always said, uh, even beforehand, was you ask somebody how their day was. Nobody comes up to you with a bullet point list. I washed the dishes, I took the kids to school, I dropped my sandwich on the floor. You know, nobody does that. Everything's in the, in, in the realm of a story. Uh, so as you begin to really look at that, and say, how was your day? Oh man, you know, forget all the other details. <laughs> you know, it's just this one big event that happened where there was, you know, a, a raccoon got loose in the school or something. You know, you just don't know what it, what it might be, but those are the things that really define who we are. So when we can begin to use those in the classroom, it makes it stick. Um, one of my favorites from not too long ago is um, we were doing some, a course on really just kind of interpersonal relations uh, and you know focusing on the issue, not the individual was the big idea behind it. Um, but there was one character on there that was kind of the negative guy uh, of the whole thing. And actually that became the mantra around the office. Everyone that went through that course, it wasn't so much that they took everything away from that course and they got these six wonderful steps on how to, you know, have better interpersonal conversations, but they walked around, they walked away saying, don't be Ned, 
<laughs> you know? So, but anybody that went through that course understood immediately that their focus in the conversation was either negative or wasn't moving the conversation forward. And those are the type of things where you, you just, when you see it, it, it makes you laugh. It proves the point and it keeps it from being a drawn out conversation and it lightens the mood at the same time. So it was, it was just an excellent, um, example really where that just kind of permeated an entire organization you know to the point that almost t-shirts were made <laughs> to uh, to that whole concept of just being positive focus on the issue not the person you know lead by example all the different things that were a part of that were, were just gathered in that one you know what is that don't be that three three words you know <laughs> so um, it, it's beautiful and that's that's where really that particular exercises where it's solidified in my mind, if we can laugh a little bit, if we can find something that represents the bigger picture, you know, we can all move forward at the same pace and, and, and in a lighter mood, which helps us to think better as well. So um, yeah. part of what I do is nerd out on the whole neuroscience of learning too. So uh, if you've never just put in neuroscience learning and, and Ted, there's a shameless plug for Ted talks. Um, you can, learn a lot from that as well and, and you know in short 15 minute bites which is also nice yeah yeah we, we love ted talks and neuroscience as well so the the last uh business that we owned before the pandemic was called mind gym so we were yeah. focused a lot on uh called, something called neurobics and aerobics teaches you to use your brain in a different way like stand on your left foot or brush your teeth with your opposite hand or eat with your eyes closed mm -hmm. so it's about engaging your senses but in a different way and creating different pathways in your in your brain yeah i really uh, like what you said about the you know you come out of there saying don't be mad and just focusing on that instead of coming out and saying what are all the positive things and thinking of all the positive things mm -hmm. it's a different way of thinking because usually when you go to a course you just hold on to the positive things but when you focus on that don't be mad. Mm -hmm. Oh, it, it's it kind of changes your mindset on how you even okay. So how do I not be mad through the rest of the day? So that's right. really cool to think about it that way. Yeah, and it's a ripple effect. That's the beautiful part about it too. Um, that one conversation or that one statement really does kind of ripple through the you know the organization or or those that are involved in that conversation. And that was one of the things that I saw that was so amazing to me was from the individual contributor all the way up to our executive level saying that one phrase could get everyone's attention and like okay well what what is it what's causing it so now we move over into root cause analysis well why what is causing this you know and they start looking at that is there something in our process we need to change to make this easier um and just like you said just opening your mind up to doing different things but just being by once, I mean, literally, it was an hour and a half course that literally changed the mindset of, of an organization around how, how we thought, which was pretty spectacular. Absolutely. No, that's great. That's great. So in the, in the learning and development world, are there any areas that you see where learning and development maybe is, is not doing so well or maybe it's, it's failing? Yes, um, I'm facing it now. Um, for those that um, I guess nobody's going to know. So, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so for those that don't know, because I'm on television every night. No, <laughs> just, ah, there's my brain at work. No, but for just in the most recent, just using my own experience as an example, uh, just this past March, I was laid off from my last organization that I worked for. Um, and in the process of being back in the job market, as I'm approaching even other professionals that I know um, or have known for, for years even that have an idea of what I do, when I try to explain to them what it is that learning and development is, we, they don't really get it. So I think as a, an industry or as a profession or as really more so as a part of the culture of an organization, learning and development is really behind and really stamping out, this is what I do in this organization. This is my role in this organization. And I think that's why it's so easy to be the first one out when it's time to cut budget because the value of what we do is not really understood. And for a long time, it was hard to measure as well. So we're getting better at measuring it, 
Um, but the impact, you know, when we get to the point where we can really begin to measure impact, and we're, we're doing better. It takes time, of course, um, to get there. But when we can begin to really validate the impact that we make, it will sound bright. You know, it'll sound a lot louder for, for learning and development. But I think that's one of the areas that we could get so much better at. Uh, from the training coordinator to the instructional designer that's doing one project, just making sure people understand why, you know, what's our why, why are we here? What are, what is, what we, what does what we do do for the organization, even at the highest level, you know, uh, when it comes to the goals or, or, or culture or values of the organization, how does what we do impact all the way to that level? And I think that's, what's missing a lot of times it's uh, trainings that, something that gets pencil whipped is something that you dread going to. Um, it's forced on you um, instead of being seen as an avenue um, or a tool for you to get better at what you do. And, and that to me is the downfall of the, of learning in the, and really the corporate and business space uh, at an individual level. We do it every day. We're on YouTube all the time. We Google everything that we want, but we fail to take those cues as how our culture is working and begin to use them in that, corporate and business world so that there has a, there's a similar flow. Um, so if you can't tell, it's a soapbox of mine. <laughs> I think it's, it's a, it's a big pain point. I'm, and it's became so much more magnified as I'm explaining to people what I do um, or how I do what I do in this, in, you know, in this season. And it's really like, wow, they don't get it. And that's a problem. That's a big problem. Yeah. I've been hearing, you're not the only one, so you're, you're not <laughs> alone. I mean, almost every single learning and development professional I've spoken to has said the same thing. It's, it's difficult to sell the importance, um, you know, especially when it comes to like personal development skills and things like that to the upper management. They just, they don't, they want to see a, you know, an immediate return on, on the, taking an action. And with learning and development, it takes time to see the return on your investment, I think, and that's what they struggle with. But I'm really saying that through them being in business for so long, they still don't see the importance of this. I mean, there must be some, you know, we, we can't <laughs> be the only people seeing this right. <laughs> so <laughs> them being in those positions, I'm just kind of like, really? They, they don't see the importance of that all these years? Do, do we really still need to come back here and prove again that, no, this is a very important topic? It's sad. <laughs> it is. It is. And, and it's one of those Seinfeld moments. It's like, so you learned what you learned to get where you are, but oh, to get where you want to go, you don't want to learn. Yeah. But, you know. <laughs> I've been mean, reading lots of reports on it. And, you know, the, it's, they say the Fortune 500 companies, they get it. And that's why they're Fortune 500 companies. They, they realize you need to invest in your people to become profitable. It affects your bottom line. Ultimately, Absolutely. Makes your company stronger. You know, it keeps people there longer. keeps them more engaged. When, it, when an individual has passion and they're aligned with your vision, then, you know, your company is going to go so much further than someone just showing up to show up. Absolutely. Absolutely. And they're getting it more and more. Um, I always say the, the bigger ones, like you're saying, the Fortune 500s, they get it. And in pockets, um, I think what's happened even in that space, too, uh, having been in that arena, is that the learning that's happening there has been playing catch up. Mm -hmm. So you end up now where the learning that you've done was great because it walked through people through a process. Um, even the leadership development that was there, it helped people with where they are but really if we look at the last 20 years let's just go from 2000 which is insane to think it's been 20 years <laughs> since since i partied like it was 1999 uh, <laughs> because it was <laughs> um, that yeah but that in the last 20 years how has our sh how have we shifted i mean just as a as a as a culture not as a, even as a nation but as a world when it comes to social media, when it comes to um, diversity and inclusion, and these things play a huge part in the learning scape and the learning curve. So now those same companies, and I applaud them for everything that they've done, but it's time to look at it again because you're still trying to send me to a day and a half course 
that you expect me to implement when I get back from it, <laughs> you know, um, where nothing in my world today goes for an hour and a half except for a movie. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> And I'm not required to remember that, but I remember the movie because it's telling me a story. Yeah. 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 <laughs> That's a good point. So again, these are those things where as a learning professional, if we can begin to highlight these things and, and I think the last organization, I, I love 3A. I know, I understand, you know, what took place as far as the business scape. And I always like to say that up front, but as far as a working environment, I have never worked in a better place in my life where they just took on and they said, I understand Okay, well, let's do that. None of our courses, you know, that we created were more than 10 minutes long. Uh, if we were doing a day long course, we were doing a plant tour. We were doing some new information. We were doing activities um, out of the eight hours that we spent with somebody. Maybe two was spent specifically explaining our product. The rest was activities so you could engage with the product. It was doing a plant tour so you could learn how the product was made. So it was building that story around what they what they were receiving. Um, so again, it's, you know, those, even in that space, I'm glad you brought that up. I think they're, they do do an excellent job with it, but this is where we're having to grow forward as well. We have to look at all this stuff, just like we had to get rid of flash. <laughs> you know, we had to move all our stuff away from flash that was on the computer. You know, we're having to do the same thing with our learning and development and say, let me relook at what I have. Is it relevant for today? It's relevant for my business, but is it relevant for my learner? And uh, on this day as well. And that's that I think is the is the tipping point that's going to really make the difference in those co those companies that succeed going forward. Mm -hmm. At least those that are in the service industry, those that have a product, eh, you know, point and click and let her rip. So <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, and just to add to that, I mean, sometimes maybe the thing is it's just it's change. And yeah, yeah. change is sometimes just difficult to, you know, like you said, the example moving from flash, people agree, okay, yeah, it's better to move the other way, but really, I gotta go through <laughs> all that. I mean, I understand, but do I have to go through all that? You know, I think it's just fear of change, you know? Yes, yeah, 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 for sure, for sure. Yeah, and I think 2020 was great for that. It pushed so many companies and, and really industry as a whole ahead five, 10 years, because they had to figure it out to stay afloat. Yes. Um, so, I, you know, I, I don't, I'm, you know, I'm the first one to say, let's, you know, we can kind of forget about 2020 best we can, sweep it under the rug. But uh, from an industrial standpoint and from, you know, from a business standpoint, it was, it was needed time to really wake everyone up and say, hey, we got to do things differently. Um, to be able to be successful going forward. And I think we'll, we'll begin to see the, the fruits of that very soon. Um, there was an article I was reading on, on uh, LinkedIn. Um, and you may have seen it uh, as well. We were saying the, uh, the great resign <laughs> coming, you know, is the great resign coming yeah, where people yeah, are going to resign yeah, from organizations? That. Yeah. Based off of not being able to work from home or not be able to have a remote work environment where they've had it for the last, you know, 12 to 18 months. Mm -hmm. um, I thought that was kind of interesting in it, in, you know, even from a, um, you know, industry standpoint, you know, are we, are we ready to do that? And a lot of companies aren't ready because they haven't built that into their infrastructure. They're still rather have less productivity and look at you than they would create a performance, you know, um, create goals that actually cr cause a person to perform and allow them to the, the bandwidth to do what they're supposed to do. Uh, as opposed to be able to stare at them in the office. Um, so that's going to be interesting to see, too, uh, how how everything adjusts, even in that realm, because if they're really thinking people are going to start resigning based off of that, yeah, uh, we're going to see another lopsided economy in a different way because the companies that are more forward-thinking or are more electronic or better built around performance management, they're, they're going to be the ones that excel. Yeah, yeah, that would be interesting to see see what yeah. happens in the future. So, I'm going to switch gears on you a little bit. Yeah. Uh, we're talking <laughs> about fun and games at work. So, uh, what do you think about that? Do you think we should, you know, work should be fun and games? Should we have fun and games at work? Uh, what's your What's your experience there? I say absolutely yes. <laughs> um, there's only 
one field where it's not fun and games and it's called surgery. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they probably the do. rest, we need to live it up a little. <laughs> you know, we need to lighten up a little bit, you know. Um, it, it's, it, it is, and we, we learn better that way as well. And like you, you alluded to, Matt, it is, it's healthy for us. Um, you know, it's proven we're in a good mood or when we're jovial, we actually think more outside of the box, for lack of a better term. You know, we're more creative in how we come about things. You know, we, we face a problem differently than if we're buried underneath, you know, the weight of everything that's going on. Um, and we have a little bit more freedom there in that space as well. Some of the best times to watch are just children on a playground or, you know, a child playing by themselves with some toys. They come up with the most outlandish ideas. Um, you know, I actually recorded and call him my he's kind of my god nephew. <laughs> uh, just this past weekend and uh, you know he had Legos and he was putting them together and next thing you know you say oh they're cars and then they were robots and I was like oh all right cool so now they're robots so they need to stand up he's like uh yeah they can stand up so we started refiguring it so that they could stand up you know he got frustrated because his wouldn't stand up yeah and I yeah. think he was and he started to get frustrated I was like well what could you do to help us stand up he's like well I think it needs another leg. Cool. Let's put another leg on it. So here we have a three-legged robot. But the, but the idea was, you know, again, when he started to get frustrated with that, it was like, no, no, this is, we got to figure out how to make it work. So here are these pieces and this and just showing him some different ideas. And he came up with it on his own. I think this is the same thing we do in the workplace. Uh, we're so, you know, dead set on it having to work this way. And nine times out of 10, innovation has always come out of the mistake or the workaround. You know, not yeah. the process that was in place. And I, and I was, you know, I've been a party on both sides of that from a trainer and playing with a three-year-old uh, to changing a process on a multi-million dollar line, you know. Uh, but it came out of that same idea, you know, like what, what can I do to kind of make this better? Actually, my original idea at that multi-million dollar plant was how can I get out of here early on Fridays? So <laughs> quite honestly, that's how that worked out. Um, but what I did, literally, I'm, I'm, I'm in a field, in a, in a facility with a bunch of scientists and physicists and all the other it's that are out there. And, and they're extremely intelligent people um, that I learned a ton from. But this simple process of trying to get a product to dry is the little kid with the film degree that figured it out because I was thinking outside mm -hmm. of, I need to dump all this stuff in the vat and just watch it. You know, <laughs> let's sit here and watch it drip, you know? Uh, okay. Well, why don't we put a little bit in that at a time, let that drain, it dries, put another little bit in there. And they're trying to figure out how I'm leaving at two o'clock on Fridays instead of being there till six. Um, yeah. And it took them three weeks before somebody asked me. Mm -hmm. Wow. <laughs> then there's that. So as you can see, there's, there's, there's all kinds of little, you know, ant hills and tunnels that really, I think, um, learning helps answer but when it comes back to the fun part of it and, and thinking about that these are those things that that are birthed out of just you know enjoying the workplace or enjoying what you're doing or, or being having that freedom to explore uh, and i think that's what really begins to make work fun as well yeah yeah no i i agree i mean i, I worked in the corporate world for for many years and you do sometimes you get stuck in these processes and people just don't want to budge and i think you mm -hmm. It does stifle creativity. It doesn't allow you that freedom. And you, and you feel a little bit, you, people get frustrated. Mm -hmm. Oh, why do we have to follow this process? You know, it doesn't make sense. And so, yeah, I think, I mean, it's good to have processes. It's good to know what I need to do. Absolutely. To do, but I think you also need to have some leniency in the process. Uh, you can adapt it depending on the situation. Definitely. Definitely. So uh, as far as this, this whole conversation has gone, learning and development and playing games. Is there one kind of key takeaway or key information that you'd like our audience to, to hear? Uh, yeah, I think that the, the big idea, I guess, for me is to explore the depth of what learning is in the organization. Um, you know, I think we, we kind of yeah, we kind of, I guess we could say spider webbed our way through it in a sense. We're talking through different topics, but 
the idea is that all of this comes out of the learning function or the development function, organizational development, learning and development function of a business. Um, and when you really take the time to think about it, honestly, you don't have to think really hard on how learning has impacted the organization. Um, and, and in that, you know, we have to realize that it's also one of those things that's iterative. It's not a, you know, it's not going to be one time and go. So uh, I guess without starting to dig into it again, you know, the, the concept there is just, you know, just sit back and realize, you know, what learning really has done in your organization. It's in your processes, but it's also in your innovation. Um, it's in the attitudes of your employees, but it's also in their productivity, you know, and it's, and they all work hand in hand and where they find this information out outside of just living life is the things that we're doing to assist them in growing in that organization. So I think that's the, it's kind of the big idea to me out of all of and, and it. And it doesn't have to, doesn't have to suck. It can be fun. <laughs> you know, it can definitely be fun and memorable and, and, and change the trajectory of your organization. I've seen it happen. Mm -hmm. uh, well, thank you very much. Mm -hmm.